All right, if you need a handout book tonight, if you would raise your hand, the ushers can come and hand you one. We'll continue on in our series on being a disciple of Jesus Christ. So if you need a, a booklet there, a handout, just keep that arm raised and the ushers will come help give you one of those. We do have a pad to pass out tonight. If I could, Brother Byler, can you give me a hand? Sorry, Pastor Ryan, we'll give you a break tonight. And uh, this is uh, for our missionaries. Oh, I meant your son, but you can too. Oh, he's already up. Your dad, how'd your dad beat you up here? Thank you. Here, oh, you're a man. I like that. <laughs> um, for, those, for, for the missionaries, we like to get them some gift cards when they come. We thought about putting some baskets in their rooms uh, when they come uh, for our missions conference in June, but when you start to travel around as a missionary, you get a basket everywhere you go. Eventually, all the grapes turn to mush, all the bananas turn brown. Gift cards don't spoil. And so if we could give those missionaries, when they come, some gift cards to Walmart, gift cards to Meyer, gift cards to Speedway for gas, that will be a help to them. A uh, bigger help than maybe some Oreos in the room, though those are always a blessing in your room. And so if you could sign up and help us with that, that would be tremendous. For our missions conference, we'll be doing a few things. A few years back, you'll remember, we had these little books we called passport books. Inside those passport books, uh, the children can grab them, the adults can as well. You can get those around, and when you go to a missionary, you get a stamp for that particular missionary. And you can fill up the whole passport so you can see the different missionaries, may know that you made contact with them. We're getting some things out so that you'll have an idea of what the missionaries look like. How many have been here before, and you've introduced yourself to a, to a missionary and didn't realize they were the missionary here that day? Anybody ever done that before? I have. didn't realize their face. Maybe they're a new missionary. We're going to get some pictures out so that you can recognize them so that when they come in the door, I would love for this to happen, that you say, hey, you are, username, we're so glad you're here today. Now, wouldn't that make someone feel welcome if they come in the door to church like this and all of a sudden people are calling their name and, and, and even know where they're going to minister or have been ministering the area they have been to? And I'd like us to be able to do that as a church here. And so, and also you'll find the night inside of your prayer bulletin, a card that looks like this, a Michigan Revival Conference. And that is coming up June 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th. That's going to be a great conference. You remember that last year we had it here at First Baptist Church. The evening services were right here. And that was tremendous. In fact, a number of you told me about what God did in your heart after that particular conference. This year... They're going to have it not here, but at Emmanuel Baptist uh, in Owasso, and then Landmark Baptist in Clio. And you say, well, Pastor Howell, why aren't they going to have it here? Did you not want it here? I, I said they could have it here. But what they, they scheduled it without realizing that I'm taking all the male staff out to Spiritual Leadership Conference in Lancaster, California. And so all of us will be gone for four days, those exact four days we're going to be in California. And it's really hard to be in two places at one time. Your women can do it, but us men, we have trouble with that. And so I offered, the services offered, and they looked at moving it, and they couldn't move it. And so the meetings will be down there, uh, those two locations. You'll see that evening in uh, Emmanuel and the daytime at Landmark. And I would love for us to do our part and attend those things when you're able to. They'll also have that conference choir again, and many of you sang in that choir last year. And if you're willing to sing that again, I'd love to support this, to support this conference and glad for the cause of revival in the state of Michigan. And appreciate Dr. Flanders, who's heading that up, his heart for revival and for this state and his prayer for that. I spoke to him today about this and so thankful to be a part of that and be able to support that as we do. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Now, if you remember, we started this one a few weeks back. And this particular session, this section, is on the word we call discernment. Discernment, the ability to see people and circumstances as they really are. So we've gone through this. This is, you look at the top there, lesson number five. We've done the other four, and I think there's seven total. Each particular one has as its main point a word that begins with D. And so this one is, the, it's the D's of discipleship. This is discernment. The discernment is, is the ability to see things in a, in a way that may be different than others can see it. Sometimes people have a discerning eye uh, with, with color choices, like with decorating or with clothing choices. Sometimes people have discernment in financial decisions. They'll have a, they'll have a, a different vision for choosing stocks than someone else. They'll be very discerning in that, making good investments. We say that's discerning. We would say someone that had maybe a, a bad company of friends, they would have no discernment in their friends' choices. 
And what we're, what we're supposing here is that as a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, we ought to, as Christians, have a discernment for the things of God. We ought to have some wisdom in how we operate. Those are the things we're looking at. Hebrews chapter number 5, verse 14, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Now that doesn't mean in this passage full age as in you are old physically. Some of us are as of a full age, physically speaking. And this is not referring to just full age physically, but full age spiritually. I've known some people that have gray head on top of their hair, but inside their spiritual heart, they're still a spiritual toddler. And I've known some young people who are still very young in elementary school, but exhibit characteristics spiritually that are of full age. You see some stands they take. We notice it sometimes at testimony time and we'll have young people give testimonies. Sometimes after camp the teenagers will and when they come up to give a testimony they're doing things that some of you Christians who have been saved longer who should be of full age aren't. That's what he's speaking about, full age. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. He's referencing the fact that, that as you age and mature, you can eat things that you didn't used to be able to eat. This past weekend, uh, my sister and brother-in-law came in, and my newest niece, I only have one niece, the newest, no, I have three, three nieces now, but the newest niece, Audrey Grace, came. She was born on Halloween. I don't know if that's significant or not, it just is. And she has, I think, two teeth on the bottom, and that's it. And you know what? They did not feed her ribeye steak, and that offends me. I love ribeye steak. What am I? Thank you, brother. See, so I'm glad you're still awake. I love ribeye steak. A good medium, rare, or rare ribeye steak. I mean, and, and she ought to be able to eat that right now, but she only has two teeth. So she eats things like milk and, and green beans with apricot, peach, and tomato puree. Have you seen what they put in those things? Because she's not of full age yet. Well, he's saying, spiritually speaking, strong meat, the, the deep discernment, belongs to those who are spiritually able to digest them. The rest of that verse says, even those who by reason of use, so this is kind of the indication of that, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. This verse tells us that there are some good things and there are some bad things. Can I get an amen? Amen. That means there are good choices and there are bad choices. There are things that we ought to do and things that we shouldn't do. There is good and evil. Boy, you've had, probably had this question before from another Christian. Well, I don't see what's wrong with fill in the blank. I don't see what's wrong with living with my girlfriend. <laughs> the Bible. The Bible. I don't see where it says I have to come to church. Well, read it one more time. You'll find it. You'll find it. Well, I don't see why I have to react that way. I can react the way I want to. Keep on reading. Their senses have been exercised to discern both good and evil. They remind me of what it says about the children of Israel in the book of Judges, that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. This, what we're talking about tonight, is the opposite of that. Whereas Christians, we begin to exercise and display discernment. A little phrase I gave one mark of a mature Christian is the ability to make good, Christ-honoring decisions. I used this before, but I saw it again tonight. I take the young fisherman out to supper. And after we go soul winning, that's the third through sixth grade, we go to a fast food restaurant. I told you about this time, it was last year, when a, a young man had just came for the first time to Young Fisherman, and I do not monitor what they buy. Okay, so parents, if you send your children, they can buy whatever they feel like it, and I will not monitor them, okay, in that way. You say, Pastor Howell, why would you not? I'm not there to babysit their food choices. I take them to a good, healthy option, like McDonald's, Wendy's, or Taco Bell, or Arby's, and beyond that, they get this. So this one young man comes up and says, hey, Pastor Howell, can I buy, and he says, a shake from Arby's perfectly legitimate question I asked, w would your mother let you have that? He said, oh yes. No problem. Can I buy a cookie, Pastor Howell? Would your mother let you buy? Yes. I said, I don't care what you buy. And he steps away from the counter with the largest shake that Arby's offers, Jamocha shake, 
and a large cookie. Oh man, I heard at SOS that night he was bouncing off the walls. I don't know why. They have a good time in SOS. We would say that that's not a great decision. We would say that's not a lot of discernment because you know you're not going to feel well if you just eat sugar and then crash afterwards. Yet as we have mature Christians, they make good decisions and immature Christians make foolish decisions. That's what we're talking about tonight. I gave you a few of these and I'll give those to you again real quick. Number one is how to determine God's will. Discernment shows us how to determine God's will. We talked about this last time. I'll just fill in the blanks this time so we can catch up. How to determine God's will. Ephesians 5.17 Wherefore be not unwise, but understanding the will of the Lord, or understanding what the will of the Lord is. Not only how to determine God's will, but number two, how to know God's timing in decision making. God doesn't use the same clock that you and I use. Not the same watch, not the same year. I wish he did sometimes. You've probably felt like I have. Lord, did you forget about me? Did you forget about this problem? Of course, he didn't forget about it. Discernment shows us how to know God's timing in decision making. And number three, how to choose proper friends. How to choose proper friends. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Proverbs 13, 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. That's where we stopped last time. Let me just make a note there for you. That verse is true for adults and for children. That your friends, your company of people you hang around can either help you or hurt you. All right, they can be profitable or they can be a problem in your life. And I want friends around me that are profitable. And beyond that, I want to be a profitable friend. You know what a great place to find some friends? Right here at church. Right here at church. Well, no one likes me at church. Well, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. You can talk to people at church. You can ask them how they're doing. Well, no one asks me how they're doing, how, 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 how I'm doing. Well, ask somebody else how they're doing. Show a little bit of interest in someone else and surround yourself with wise counsel so that you're not destroyed. That's what, the, that's what Proverbs, the verse in Proverbs says. Well, move on, though, to number four. That's just a side note. That was free. Number four, how to enjoy God's direction in dating, engagement, and marriage. So have a word of prayer, we'll start right there tonight. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. For this time, Lord, I pray you'd guide us, direct us. Lord, would you give us your wisdom from your word. Lord, touch our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, it's on your paper. You can look at it in your Bible either way. It says this, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Proverbs 5, 9, Lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy hears unto the cruel. And 2 Corinthians 6, 14-18, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth in it with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and touch not, or and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You say, well, Pastor Howell, dating, engagement, marriage, you know what? It's kind of a weird thing to talk about in church. It, it, it is a little bit, yeah, or maybe it's not. I want you to give you a couple thoughts about this tonight in discernment of this. First of all, understand this in dating, engagement, and marriage. This has always been God's idea. This has always been God's idea. How do I know that? Well, Genesis 2.18 tells me that. God was... Uh, creating the world, speaking it into existence. After every day, he stopped and looked around and said, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's not good. In Genesis 2 verse 18, God says, it is not good that man should be alone. I agree with the Lord. I am so thankful that God brought me a wonderful lady like Doreen. But listen, if you're single, I have a thought for you. If you're single, there are worse things than being single. Being married to the wrong person. 
I have seen, I am not, so I haven't experienced that. But I have seen what that looks like. And it appears to be horrible. This has always been God's idea. We ought to use discernment in this area, should we not? But wouldn't you like someone to, to marry someone in, in, in a good light? Or, or do you want them to not use any, any judgment in choosing whom they marry or date or get engaged to? No, they ought to use discernment. This has always been God's idea. The world wants to redefine what this looks like. It wants to redefine dating, redefine engagement, and redefine marriage. The, the, the unsafe people do not like the philosophy that the Bible presents. Obviously, when you talk about marriage, you have the idea, Ephesians chapter 5 speaks on it, uh, on the roles of husband and wife in a marriage. Of course, those who are opposed to the Word of God say, you know what, the Bible just speaks of, of pushing down women and exalting men. And women just have to submit, 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 submit. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. That does teach submission. But what the Bible teaches is that husband and wife are equal in value, but different in roles. Equal in value, but different in roles. We understand this in every other walk of life. All right? Not everyone can do the same thing. That's why when you, when you go to a store, there's different jobs to be done. Some people stock the shelves. Some people run the cash register. And some people steal things. And it's just different roles at the store. <laughs> different roles everywhere you go. Inside of a marriage, there are different roles. Because the husband has responsibility to make the decisions does not make him more important than, than a wife. Ever. It gives him more responsibility. It means he better step up to the plate and make the decision because God's going to ask him about how he made decisions. God's not going to ask Doreen how she made decisions for the Howell family. God's going to ask me about that. And at that day, I can't say, well, my wife didn't want to, men. Well, my wife wouldn't let me. Thanks, Brother Mitchell. I can stay here for a second. <laughs> Bought a motorcycle a few years back. I didn't realize how divisive a motorcycle was among, among win, men and women until I bought a motorcycle. I tell you what, there were men in this church, tell you right, there were men in this church, I'm, I'm going to say it right now, that went to my wife and said, will you talk to my wife and help her let me buy one too? <laughs> there were women in this church that went to Doreen and said, I don't know how you let your husband buy a motorcycle. And she told him, she goes, do you know my husband? If he wants one, he's going to get one. I heard about a couple once, and the husband wanted or needed whatever to buy a truck, and, and how, how I heard about it was that the wife didn't want to buy a truck and said, you're not buying this truck. My wife and I had heard about that at the same time, and she goes, I have a feeling if I said that, you'd probably go buy the truck. Now, that's not because I do everything she says not to do. All right? Before I bought the motorcycle, I called my wife. The day I went to go buy it, and I said, honey... I'm about to buy this motorcycle. Here's how this went down. Like years ago, I said, honey, I want to buy a motorcycle. She goes, buy one. I just can't. It's not the right time. I prayed about it. It's not the right time. All right? So I had sold a car. I had some money. I said, I'm going to buy a motorcycle. She goes, buy one. It wasn't the right decision. I bought a van, a family van. I bought a van. A few years later, someone came to me and offered me a great deal on a motorcycle. And I said, honey, I want to buy a motorcycle again. She goes, buy the motorcycle. And I bought another van. So it was about a year and a half later, I'm, I'm sitting there a Sunday afternoon between church, and I'm on my phone and, and looking at motorcycles, and I said, honey, I, I want to buy a motorcycle. She goes, I have told you for the last like eight years to buy the motorcycle, buy the motorcycle. See, I don't do what she told me to do. <laughs> but when I went to buy it, I called her, I said, honey, I said, I want to know that you're okay with this thing. Because if you're not okay, I would not be okay with you not being okay. I didn't say make the decision for me, but I care about what my wife thinks. I'll try not to be a fool. She saved me a lot of hurt and grief along the years, and hopefully vice versa. This is God's plan, His design, His plan. It's always been God's idea. The world wants to redefine it. We ought to do a few things. We ought to, first of all, we ought to teach our children and others around us in the church the proper view of relationships. The proper view of relationships. It is not just about me, it's about others. That's the tenor of the Bible. 
If you read your Bible, you see that God was worried about us other than himself. He sent his son Jesus for others, not himself, okay? And, that's, and that is our view of relationship. It's about others, not just about me. We ought to teach them in this day and age how to properly speak to and interact with guys and, and girls. There's a way to interact. There's a way not to interact. There are things to joke about. There are things not to joke about. There are topics of conversation that should not be discussed among, among the, the opposite genders, right? And, and kids don't naturally know this. Some adults don't naturally know this either. Discernment. Discernment. Discernment in, in dating and making godly choices. You know, the Bible still says that it is, that it is wrong to be immoral before you're married. The living with, a, with someone else of the opposite sex and, 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 and being immoral in those things is against the Bible. It's wrong. It's sinful. The Bible says that. I didn't make it up. Remember, this was always, it has always been, God's plan and God's idea. This is, so he says, this is what it ought to look like. It ought to look like, like two Christians, so we're not unequally yoked. I said two Christians, all right, not one saved and one that's going to get saved when they come to church, but two Christians, all right, um, looking to, to serve God together. But not only in dating and engagement, but in marriage, we need discernment. Remember the definition of discernment? The ability to see people and circumstances as they are. Boy, you, you get married and you have a husband and a wife from two different backgrounds. Man and woman, two different wavelengths. Maybe two different states. And if you don't use discernment, you're going to have discussions. If you don't solve discussions, you end up in divorce. Discernment. The ability to see people and circumstances as they really are. Remember one time my wife and I were talking and I, I asked, I said, honey, where's my blue shirt? And that day she goes, well, you know, honey, I, I did the dishes this morning and, and I did this and I, and I cleaned this up. I did this and, and did this and did this and did this. And it was a rather lengthy answer to my question, where's the blue shirt? I never found out where my blue shirt was. I said, honey, I just wonder where my blue shirt is. And that day we were working through how men and women communicate. When I asked, where's my blue shirt, she thought I was asking hey, did you do anything at all today? And what I really was asking was, where's my blue shirt? I'm just curious where the blue shirt is. I, was, I just didn't where it's at. Discernment says, what is my wife, what is my husband, what's this other person thinking? What, what are they processing? So rather than reacting to what I hear or see, discernment looks deeper than that. That's why as disciple of Christ we have to use discernment. Couples ought to have discernment. What would our marriages look like if we started to have godly discernment? Maybe there'd be less discussions. Well, I could stay there for a while, but we got many to go for. So number five, how to maintain a godly musical appetite. How to maintain a godly musical appetite. I will in the next year or two... I'll spend some time on speaking, preaching about music. What an absolutely hot topic. You want to get people riled up in the Christian circuit, just begin to talk about music in clear terms. And people start to disagree very vehemently. You start to rain on their parade. A couple verses right here that I'd like you to look at on your sheet or in the Bible. They're the same that way. Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Psalm 95, 95 1, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. That's not rock and roll, by the way. That's rock of our salvation. Maybe some of you ought to underline that. Another one's not on the sheet, but it's a great music verse. It's Psalm 40, verses 3 through 5. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Music has such an effect on us. Music, maybe in the past you've listened to some ungodly music. 
And if you have, I, I'm sorry for you, but what you'll find, and maybe it was in high school, you can walk into a restaurant, you can walk into a store, you can walk into Myers, you can hear two notes, one chord of a song. And with one chord or two notes of a song, your mind will take you back right to when you first heard or a time in your life when you heard that song. Not only that, your mind will then begin to replay the entire song and relive an experience or circumstance in your life. Beyond that, your emotions will now get involved and you'll begin to feel and have certain real feelings, sadness or joy, all from two notes or a chord. That's why it's so important to have discernment to have godly music in your heart. It's okay to be humming this little light of mine when you wake up in the morning. That's why... In our house, we do our best to always mute commercials. Oh, got a little quiet in here. I'm sorry, you probably didn't hear what I said. That's why in our house, we do our best to always mute commercials. You say, well, they're so funny, Pastor Howell. Well, sure they are. They're hilarious. And they're almost always filled with ungodly music. Well, look what you're missing out on, Pastor Howell. We laugh for a good minute and a half. And you and I both know that those songs commercials can just play over and over in your head and you find yourself just humming them. I've walked out of stores where the music was so overpowering that I could not, I could not stay in that store. Uh, music affects me, it, may be, it, it affects all of us in, in different ways. Because of my music background, because I'm around music a lot, I find myself humming with the music that's playing, even, not, not even consciously. So I can walk into a store, and I'm hearing the chord structure, the rhythm of the song, how they're, how they're, how they're doing the song, and, and not even, I would never hear the song, but I know where it's going next because there's certain patterns in music. I'm like, well, I don't want that in my, in my mind, all right? Some places I have to go to, but I, I went to stores and Birch Run Outlets, I walked into it, and I promptly walked back out. So that is so overpowering, it feels oppressive in my, in my soul. I want to have godly music, and we spend so much time arguing for the music that we want to justify rather than seeking God's face and what will glorify. See, in music, we use words like this, and I'll give some of it now. I'll probably have to end here tonight. I'll do, like I said, a, a, a little bit of time on this later on. But we use terms like this left and right in music. All right, so in left and right terms like this, ch churches are people that listen to music that would be more wild or more progressive. Uh, they're, they're left of us, right? They're, they're left of us. Woo, boy. And those churches, boy, yeah, you those little churches, oh, it's crazy over there. You hear those churches? Crazy. They're, they're way left. They went way left with their music, brother. They were sliding. Back 10 years ago, they, they held microphones in their hands, or they're left of us. And then someone who is, who is more conservative than we would be, they're, they're right of us. This is what we say, what we mean by that. These people over here, they're so far gone, there's no way that God could use this music over here. It is so wild. It, this is the devil's music. I don't care what it is. There's the left of us. And these people over here, this music is so boring, there's no way that God can be over here. So what we're really saying is, the only place God can be is right with me. <laughs> is that not what we do, though? Yeah. They're left of us, they're right of us. And that's just crazy music. I went to Bob Jones University. They, have pretty, they had pretty stringent music standards. Uh, for years, that would be a, a slam to some people. Oh, that's Bob Jones music. Yeah. Maybe some of you've heard that before. And definitely Sunday morning. You know, Mom, that Sunday morning they'd play the, they'd play the organ and uh, they definitely had a more of a conservative approach to Sunday morning mass as us boys like to laugh about it sometimes. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I remember a time I was standing in the amphitorium with six to 7,000 students singing Nearer Still Nearer. Told him it was, it was touching. I've sung the doxology. I still appreciate the doxology. People laugh at the doxology, but I appreciate it. With a, with a fourfold amen on the end. Amen, 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 amen. Now, not everyone's touched by that, but, but, but I can appreciate that. G God can work through that music. There's other music over here that I could never do at First Baptist Church. 
and I would not do it First Baptist Church. That doesn't mean that God's not in it. You say, oh, Brother Howell, now you're going crazy. You're crazy now because no one over there can, can be used of God. No one. Really? Did, no one? I'm Puerto Rican. I've been to Puerto Rico, to their churches. Their music ain't over there. Does that mean God's not in it? Does that mean, listen, all you Puerto Ricans sing the doxology. It's the only way God can be. You see, we want to deny this and say, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we have new, new, new revelation. But <laughs> and, and we begin the discussion that way, and I'm not saying that there's not right and wrong. There absolutely is. I just want us to redefine how we approach this so we approach it with discernment and a biblical viewpoint. Not just my own viewpoint, which says, the only place God can be is right with me. And if I think it's okay, well, then it's not too far left. And if I don't like it, then that must be way too far right. Maybe, just maybe, God's bigger than me. And I'll go a step further. It's okay for churches to be different. It's okay. It's okay for a church to have different music than First Baptist Church. Some things we'll talk about, I, I would view it this way. My philosophy is more, and this is on, on a few standards in this particular uh, department. There's a table. Picture a tabletop. On this tabletop, there's a lot of music that is acceptable. There are some music, some things that are off the table that have no part, no place in church or in our listening, period. Period. And, and understand this, one acceptable song does not make an artist acceptable. Can I tell you that, that country music's off the table? Off the table? You say, well, well, this particular this song, it's, it's so beautiful. Well, when we get to that point, let me explain. We'll explain why it's still not a wise, discerning decision. Now, if I say rap's off the table, I'm going to get amen all day long. Yeah, bless God, rap's off the table. I can name some more genres and wake you all up. But like, I, don't have time to, I don't have time to fully open up this concept. I need the time to open it up all the way. Let me just wrap it up a little bit. There's things that are on the table, off the table. But on this table, it's acceptable. But here's the key. Not all of it's appropriate. We're going to have patriotic service in a few weeks. We'll probably do a song or have the orchestra play a song, The Stars and Stripes Forever. Bum, bum, ba -dum, bum, ba -dum, bum, 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 You know that one? Bum, bum, ba -dum, bum. How many have heard that one before? Bum, ba -dum, bum, ba -dum, bum, 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 bum. I've played it multiple times. Is that on the table for Christians that they could listen to? Yeah, it's acceptable. Is it appropriate? Well, I'll answer this way. It depends. Patriotic service? Absolutely. Resurrection Sunday. Of course not. My favorite service of the year, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. The single event that separates us from every other pagan religion, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're not playing Stars and Stripes Forever. I'm sorry, we're playing Christ Arose that day. Okay? That's acceptable and appropriate. But that... Just because I, can't, I don't play it on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, does not mean Stars and Stripes Forever is off the table. It's just over here on the table, on, on this corner. There are other songs that, that are on the table, but I can't play them at First Baptist Church. They're not necessarily wicked songs, but let's go back to Puerto Rico. That wouldn't fit here in Saginaw, Michigan. It, it, we have a different culture here in Saginaw, Michigan. And, so, and we understand that, right? You don't think that's odd or weird. You understand that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Puerto Ricans are going to have a different musical style. That, that, that If you had it in Saginaw, it'd be like, are you trying to be Puerto Rican? 
It'd be a little, it'd be an uncertain sound in that, a little weird. Well, can we go a step further that, that there's a difference between uh, the north and the south in music choices as well? Yeah, yeah. I remember one time I was at a at church and this guy gets up. I have no problem. He, he actually carried a little acoustic guitar and I didn't mind that at all. But he goes, you all pray for me. You didn't have time to practice. Strumming if you want. But you'll pray for me. The devil's trying to stop me tonight. And there everybody's like, yeah, amen, amen. Well, well, you know what? If someone gets up, if, you know, Suzanne and Vanessa got up tonight and said, y'all pray for us tonight. We had no time to practice. You know, we'd be like, get off the stage. <laughs> no, we wouldn't. And they did a beautiful job. But it's, it's different, right? Down there, that was acceptable and appropriate. Up here, that's not appropriate up here. So there are things even culturally in, inside of the, the U.S. where we can see some acceptable and appropriate decisions. So what does it take? I'm glad you asked. Discernment. From whom? The Holy Spirit. And, and, and don't miss this. And I know, I mean, I, I want to open this thing up all the way for us, but I don't have time right now. So let me just... The Holy Spirit. You ever been in a decision? Maybe listen to a song, and right here, you knew you shouldn't listen to it. In your soul. Not your heart. Not the thing that pumps blood, but your, your spirit. Your spirit that... The Holy Spirit, with your spirit, was guiding you into all truth. I would put music largely into that category right there. I don't think she'd mind you telling me that, or me, me telling you this, but my mom, when she was saved, was saved from listening to the Beatles. Right, Mom? I got that right? You got saved, then stop listening to the Beatles. As she should have. Still wrong. Got real quiet in here all of a sudden. And she has told me before that there'll be a song she listens to, and all of a sudden, something in, in that other song reminds her of a song that she was saved from. Well, I don't want to be taken back to a point of pre-salvation in my life. And so she said, I, I can't listen to that song. This song may be okay, but it reminds me of this song. This song I was saved out of. God saved me from this, to this. I don't want to go back there. Her spirit. Her spirit. Throughout the years at the school, I've had young people ask me, uh, talk about music. I'm happy to talk to them. But I always talk to them, I always say this first, or now say this, I should say. I used to talk to everybody about music who, who asked me. Now I ask them, I said, I'll only talk to you if you're seeking what God has for you. If you approach this, well, I don't see what's wrong with, you're not going to have discernment. You're going to have self-justification. You're asking the same question that the man asked when he said, well, then who is my neighbor? You're asking that kind of question. Oh, well, well, you tell me why I can't listen to 99.7. Then you're asking the wrong question. You're asking the wrong question. Well, tell me, why, why, can't I have, why can't I have this group on my Pandora playlist? You're asking the wrong question. The question is, Lord, you, you're supposed to put a new song on my mouth, even praise to my God. Amen. So, Lord, help me to know what songs please you and, and bring praise to your name. Amen. Lord, guide me in my spirit. And there, there are times that I will hear a song and I'm like, I don't like that song. Now, probably because of my musical background, I could probably explain it clearer than someone else. I don't like how they're singing or their technique on it. But I don't have any corner on the market on the Holy Spirit. And I would dare say you've had the same thing happen in your life. And if you have it, then you're not exercising discernment. That doesn't please the Lord. That doesn't honor me. You know what? Then I'm going to mute you, commercial. I'm going to mute you, radio. I'm going to skip you, song. Having discernment and maintaining a godly musical appetite. Well, I did not mean to get off on there tonight. Man, we went all over the place on that one. I was getting number six, which is about how we dress. But we'll save that for next time now. So, like I said, I'll come back to that music thing. It's such an important part as we guide our lives, a pattern after, after Jesus Christ as we guide our children, help them know how to listen to, to certain things. Even to the point that my wife and I talked about what we do at Christmas time. 
what music we listen to at Christmas time and what's acceptable and appropriate. A lot, of, a lot of things in there that I don't have time to open it all up, but discernment, having the Holy Spirit guide us, help us to choose between what's good and 